I was um, I was just sharing the local weather with you. Had a little bit of, little bit of snow here, and that's just just south of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And my first poll, I'm going to be asking you lots of questions, so it's going to be nice and interactive, is where is home? So would you please take the opportunity to share with us, and I'm going to start off the poll now, where are you based? Yeah, great. Thank you very much. I'm sharing the results with you now. I hope that 79% in the UK, 19 in 16 in the rest of Europe. I think we can call it the rest of Europe, can't we? And 5% in the Americas. So thank you very much. And moving on to a little bit of introduction about myself. As Alex said at the start, I'm an IT paradigmologist. And you can see how you, you know, how do you become an IT paradigmologist? Well, you start off 35 years ago as a programmer. And you'll notice on the graph, I started off at 100% happiness. And then I got seduced into taking on management responsibilities. I soon got rid of that. And I became a consultant. And a couple of years ago, I thought, um, it's not uh, not particularly special being a consultant. I want to be a paradigmologist, so that's what I've been doing for the past the past years. I work as a self-employed uh, paradigmologist at Smalley IT, but I also work for the ASL BSL Foundation. That's a not-for-profit professional membership organisation for IT people, and particularly IT people who are interested either in the field of application lifecycle management, that's our ASL application services library part, or more interested on the business responsibilities with respect to IT, the uh, and information management. And that's our business information services library. So that's ASL and BSL. And I'm also a contractor at the APMG uh, organization, the Examination Institute, where I help them out with um, examination questions. So that's a bit of an introduction of myself. As a paradigmologist, I have the opportunity to speak at lots of conferences, and these were the places where I, uh, I spoke at last year. And it's great to be able to share with you today the, uh, the kinds of things that I've heard from, from people all around the world. So that's um, a good opportunity to share my knowledge and I'm grateful for Unicom for being invited to do this webinar because when you do these kind of things, you always revisit your own knowledge. And uh, I've re re yeah, re visited, rethought up some stuff. And I'll be presenting a couple of new insights in this presentation. The topics I'm going to cover, and you can read them for yourselves here from definitions through to um, if we get to it, the last two topics, bottom, uh, bottom right, Agile for maintenance and cloud computing and software as a service. I'm pretty ambitious with this program today. So if we start to run out of time, and by the way, we're not going to stop exactly on the hour, but we're going to run, run over by about 10 minutes because we lost that at the start. But if we do start to run out of time, I'll just give you the highlights of Agile and cloud computing, uh, just so uh, uh, we stop within the, within the hour. Uh, nice little quote here from, uh, from looking through the looking glass. Humpty Dumpty, when I use a word, it means just what I want it to mean. Neither more nor less. And this refers to the fact that it is always difficult using definitions. There really, you know, no, no absolutely standard definitions. So it's always sensible to explain what you mean by something, just to avoid confusion. 
These are the definitions, all very basic stuff, but there does seem to be quite a bit of confusion about some of the terms, so I'm going to spend a while just uh, ensuring that we're on the same, same page at the start before diving into some more specialized topics. Now I'm zooming in from a very high level here. This is my view of the world. People interact with people, people interact with things, but things also interact with things. And increasingly, people and things are equipped with information systems, the IS part here. And the wonderful invention of the internet, all these information systems and therefore people and things are connected to each other. So you've got the uh, phenomenon like the, the Internet of Things. And uh, people are saying that you, in, the, in the future you're going to have more things connected to each other via Internet than we've currently got people connected to each other. So here we've got three, three main topics, people, things and information systems. And I've just uh, depicted them in a different way here, focusing on the information system and breaking it down into three components. Data, business data, applications, which are comprised of software and more technical data as opposed to business data, and infrastructure, which is composed of hardware, software and technical data. And of course the facilities you need to keep it all up and running, like um, power supply, cooling, and stuff like that. And I'm particularly fond of splitting these three basic components up into, into two layers. The part of the information system that people and things directly deal with, often devices, you know, whether they're laptops or smartphones, they're equipped with applications and with data on the local system, on the local device. And then you've got a back office part of the information system with the same components but just, uh, just at a distance, possibly in the cloud. So now we've got a, what I call the analytical view of an application and information systems. You can see that an application is comprised of software and data. Now there's uh, another, the, the second of the four dimensions I'd like to walk you through. The informational side of an application, all very basic stuff, but it's about input and output of information, processing, data processing, data storage, and transport from one place to another. They're the five basic functions that an information system uh, uh, executes. Now we're coming on to something which um, possibly seems very obvious, but in practice, I'm run as in my consultancy, consultancy practice, I'm running into customers who who are struggling with the the basic definition of what do we actually what what do we actually call an application? Is it just a program? Is it a collection of programs? And I've done a bit of research on this, and I've come up with something that Checkland and Hol Holwell uh, wrote a while ago, saying that information systems exist to serve, help, or support people, and I've added things, in taking action in the real world. And it's a fundamental proposition that in order to conceptualize a system, which, which serves these people and things, it is first necessary to conceptualize that which is served since the way the latter is thought of will dictate what will be necessary to serve or support it. So really what they're saying here is the definition that, that you should use for an application is look at the business, look what it's actually supporting, and the collection of software that supports that, and for instance it could be supporting your HR function or your customer relationship management function, then that's the collection of software which you, which you should call an application. So it has a very strong business orientation. So that's a third of the fourth dimen four dimensions. And this is the first of the, um, the 12 statements, 12 things you, uh, you need to know about application lifecycle management. 
An application is software that people and things use to support something, whatever you think is important, in the real world. Now, the next poll, because I'm going, to, going on to the fourth dimension, the temporal, time-oriented uh, dimension of applications, is how long does the average application live after it's been released into production? So I'm sharing the poll with you now. On the, I realize it varies a lot, but on the average, hang on, you've given me the wrong poll. There we go. On the average, how long in your organization, or an organization you're most familiar with, do you think that applications live on average? I think we've got most of the votes now. 75% voted, 80% voted, 83. Seems to be stable. That's just making a note of that for myself. 40, 35, 20, and 5. Sharing that close in the poll and sharing that with you now. And you can see there's a spread between 1 to 5 years, 5 to 10 years, and 10 to 20 years. And a small percentage, 5%, say, longer than 20 years. Thank you very much for sharing that. Now I'm going to share you something that I'm always asking at conferences on, uh, on the application lifecycle management topic. And I guess it'll be about a couple of thousand people I must have asked this question. On average, they come up with something something in the region of about 12 years. I think the most wonderful quote I got from somebody was, was somebody who said, the average age is between three months and 30 years, which uh, your results also seem to reflect. So obviously a great spread in the age, but on average, say 10 to 15 years. And often people say they live a lot, a lot more longer than, you th than we thought they initially would. The dimension, the temporal dimensions, you can split up into, into a number of stages. At the beginning of the life cycle, somebody comes up with an idea, the identification of what kind of an application do we want. OK, right, so we want this kind of application. Then you go into the justification um, stage, the business case, what are the benefits and what are the costs and are we actually going to build this system? Which is the third stage, realization, designing uh, and developing the system and then it's ready to run. And then you can see I've clustered three stages together because really they're stages that run parallel with each other. You've got the operation stage when it's actually being used. But it's continually or uh, periodically being evaluated. Is it still providing the kind of support that we want the application to provide? And if not, we're going to modify it. So you've got these, these three parallel stages, operation, evaluation, and modification. And eventually, somebody says, you know, this is costing us too much. It's not giving us enough value. So we're going to decommission it. I'm going to be coming back to decommissioning later because that's a particularly tough topic. But these are the seven stages which I find particularly useful. And I've um, depicted them here graphically so you can, you can sort of see the, um, see the fact that the initial stages don't take that long in comparison with the, the long age in 10 and 20 years on average of the information system. And I've tried to depict in the, the grayish area, operation evaluation and modification, the, the periodic evaluations and the fact that they lead to modifications. Now you'll notice at the end, I started off the decommissioning phase quite a while before it actually gets decommissioned. Because what I've noticed is that people uh, decide that they want to get rid of a system, but then it starts getting, you know, it takes, it takes a while to get this stuff organized. 
because people get nervous. If we get rid of this system, are we going to get um, get into trouble because we've forgotten some kind of interface with another system? And the decommissioning of systems is is really quite a quite a well, I'm not quite sure whether it's a science or an art in itself. Coming back to that later. So the life cycle of an application starts with the identification phase, identification of needs, and ends with the decommissioning of it. So that's the that's the second statement to share with you. Now, the third poll is looking at the economics, economic significance of ALM. If you look at the total life cycle costs, how much of those costs do you think are spent after the system is actually developed, so version 1.0, and put into production? So I'm talking about the cost for running it, the cost for evaluating it, and the cost for modifying it after it's been put into production. So sharing that poll with you now. How much of the total application costs are spent during the operational lifetime? Sixty percent voted seems to be fairly stable now, so I think I'll leave it at that. And that's close share. Yeah, that's a fairly fairly widespread there, with the majority of people saying between forty percent and more than 80%. Come up to some, get back to you with some figures that I've um, gathered from people. Again, this is stuff I've asked a couple of thousand people, mostly in conferences and in workshops. What's your experience? Generally, they say between 10 and 30% spent on the development of systems, total life cycle costs, and therefore between 70 and 90 percent on all the costs after it's actually been put into production. So you can say 2080. I've depicted that in a slightly different way now, so I've taken the total um, total IT budget and put it in a, a rainbow square here. And I've taken off the pre-run costs, the 20% at the top represent the costs before the system gets into operation and the 80% during operation. Now the next question for you is, if you take those, those total life cycle costs and you take another cross-section, and I'd like to ask you, how, how, many, how much of these costs are related to applications as opposed to infrastructure? So now the polls are coming up. How, what percentage of total IT costs are related to applications? And these are the costs of staffing and licenses and stuff like that. So the total costs. Yeah, 70%, 75% have voted. Seems fairly stable, so let's leave it at, at that. Thank you very much, Jane, sharing the results with you. So you can see 18% between 20 and 
53%, the majority think that about 40 to 60% of total IT costs are application related, and about 30% more than that. Now, my experience is when I ask this question at, um, at conferences and in workshops, sorry about that, I think I went back instead of forward. Yep. These are the results that people have shared with me. Uh, this is research I did about four or five years ago, and the, the, the people who contributed came up with the with a forty percent of total costs are, are application related. But what they said was, looking at the um, looking at the trend in in the development of costs, the application part is increasing. So I would tend to say that it would now be 45, maybe 50%, so you might get a 50-50 split, which would correspond very nicely with the 53% of you who said between 40 and 60. So summing that up, the economic significance of application management, this is the third of 12 statements I'm going to share with you, 40% of total IT costs are application related, and of that 40%, 80% occurs after the deployment of version 1.0. So there's some broad brush economic figures for you to, uh, to use. Now I'm coming on to the final definition that I promised to, um, to deal with, application lifecycle management. What do you actually mean by that? And referring back to Humpty Dumpty, you know, there's, there's no really cut and dried definition of what it is. Sometimes you'll find a decent de de definition on Wikipedia, but in this case, I, I took a look at it, take a look at it for yourselves, I don't think it's very helpful. It seems to be, to me, it seems to be very tool-oriented, the Wikipedia definition. So I've, um, I've come up with one that I'm more comfortable with, and I've got two variations here. Some people use ALM just to refer to the longer-term planning and policy-making part of the applications area, whereas other people use ALM to, to embrace all of the application-related activities, including that longer-term planning and policy-making aspect. So this is what I call the small ALM and the big ALM. And um, interested in your take on this. So this is uh, this is the next poll. Which definition of ALM do you use? Do you just use it for the the smaller? I'm getting the uh, poll up here. Do you just use it for the uh, rather limited? The definition just referring to the planning aspects, longer term, I'm talking about a couple of years up front, planning, or do you use it to refer to everything? Do you have another definition? Or don't you use the don't you use the term application management in your organization? And we've got half of the votes in. two-thirds, seems to be steady now at about 70%, so I'm closing it off and sharing it with you. So as you can see, we've got most people saying they use it to refer to the total area. and. An all, well, almost yeah, equal amount saying uh, we use it for the small one or we don't use the definition at all, and a minority that says we have another definition. Uh, by the way, I, I said feel free to share your definition. At bottom right, you'll see the Twitter handle, um, hashtag Unicom Seminars, and my Twitter handle, Mark Smalley. Feel free to use Twitter to communicate stuff to us, but you can also use the chat functionality in the uh, in the webinar if you like to uh, like to share anything with us. 
And of course, if you have any questions, please use the question functionality to, uh, to pose the questions. I'll either take them on the fly or I'll look at them at the end. So, going back to the presentation. So, ALM, fourth statement, ALM always refers to the longer, longer term planning and policy making. Uh, apart from, um, sorry, <coughs> always refers to the longer term stuff, but some people, and in, in your case the majority of people, use it to refer to the whole area, including the long term planning. Now this is something I've, I've thrown in because I found it useful in explaining what, um, so, so to treating ALM as a black box, explaining what goes in and what comes out. And if you look at it as a black box, and I'm looking particularly from the, from the application management perspective rather than the initial application development perspective, what you put into the black box, service requests, change requests and projects. They're really the main things that drive application management. And of course, you'll see that there's usually a service level agreement, uh, which, uh, excuse me, <coughs> which qualifies the kind of services that are provided. And obviously, applications go into the black box because they're the things you're managing. So what's the output? You get support services out of ALM. You get run services, ensuring that the system is available and performing well. The maintenance part comes up with patches to solve problems and releases to provide new functionality. New functionality could be small or large, could be changes, could be, could be projects. You could be enhancing the functionality or just doing some small repairs. And particularly relevant, I think, is the guidance, the guide part, application man uh, lifecycle management, making recommendations to the uh, to the business, to the owners of the application, as to the kind of improvements they could make in order to get more value out of the application. For instance, if they and we'll be coming to this later, if the technical quality of the application is um, is, is becoming questionable then you might like to recommend doing a, do either doing a major renovation of the application or replacing it. So uh, sort of thinking about how can we help the business get more value out of the applications. I just mentioned changes and projects and projects is often a very confusing term because some people use projects just to refer to the initial development, whereas other people use projects also to refer to big chunks of work that are done in the application management phase. That's the AD and the AM, application development and application management. So you can see two kinds of interpretations. You'll see there's usually no um, doubt that initial application development is called application development. There's no doubt that support is called application management. But the changes and projects in between, that can vary. So that's another opportunity to, uh, for you to share amongst yourselves and with me how you use the term project in your organization. I'm launching the poll now. Do you use it project just to refer to the initial application development or to application management or to both? Or maybe you have another another opinion. Almost 60% of you have voted. Still a couple of votes coming in. Yep, up to 70%. That seems to be it. And a clear majority says that you use it for 
both. So I'm sharing the results with you now. Some say just for application development. Most say we use the term project to refer both to the initial application development, but also to presumably big kinds of uh, changes, lots of changes grouped together uh, during application management. So that was the fifth of 12 things to know about ALM. Coming on to standards and frameworks now, I've got a couple of a uh, couple of favorite standards and frameworks in this area that I'd like to share with you. One's a, one's a fairly old one, the ISO 12207, in which they look at the life cycle of software from a number of perspectives. And you can see here the primary processes, the supporting processes, and the organizational processes. And um, I'd like to focus on the primary stuff here. I find it interesting because alongside the development, operation, and maintenance aspects, which I also referred to in my uh, in my temporal um, definition of, of an application, they also refer to acquisition and to supply as two important dimensions. I'd like to like to take the opportunity to zoom in on that just for a moment. Because, and this, I, I think this is particularly exciting at the moment. You, you, as, as a as a paradigmologist, as an IT paradigmologist, I study IT paradigms. I look at the way people are looking at our changing IT world. But what I'm seeing is that that things are changing a lot. The traditional situation that the internal IT department was the prime server of IT prime provider of IT services to the business you know that's changing and you can see in this little diagram I've got an, an enterprise with a business department that serves real customers of that enterprise or citizens if it's a public organization uh, the business department obviously has obviously has employees as do the other parts but I'm just focusing on the business users for the moment and the enterprise has an internal IT department, which is served in its turn by external IT suppliers. And the uh, the dotted line refers to the fact that you you got suppliers, external IT suppliers that supply other external IT suppliers. So it depends where you are in that chain. But I didn't want to break that down in too much detail. What I'd like to emphasize is that alongside the traditional relationship between the IT department and the business, it's one of those blue arrows, you've also got the situation that some external IT suppliers have a direct relationship with the business. That's the arrow that comes, uh, uh, bypasses the internal IT department on the, uh, uh, on, on the bottom. And and this is, uh, this is the bring your own device area. Of course, lots of employees bring their own devices to work. And they haven't got their devices, haven't, you know, the IT department hasn't provided them with their devices. They've got them from an external IT supplier. And they're possibly using services, software as a service, uh, from an external IT supplier. So you've got multiple relationships uh, along the supply acquisition dimension and it's very interesting to think about um, how this is changing because the I, I'm convinced the traditional role of the of the IT department is under fire under fire from the from the left hand side in this diagram from the external providers but also from the business because the business is taking on more responsibility so the uh, the, the IT department's got something to think about I'm going to use this diagram, after I share this statement with you, to ask about your position in that ecosystem. So this is uh, statement number six. There are multiple demand supply relationships, and therefore there are multiple uh, places where ALM is done. So you've got to think about, um, when you're talking about ALM, which kind of ALM are you talking about? 
the stuff that the external service provider does, or the internal IT department, or both. Anyway, I'm going to use that diagram, which I've simplified a little bit, to ask you, um, so I can get to know you a bit better, what's your position in what I call the IT food chain? And I'm neglecting the two, um, uh, the two um, organizations on the left and the right hand side, just focusing on these, on these four. Getting the poll up now. This is the seventh of eight polls. Where do you work? And if you're a contractor, and for instance, if you've been hired by an IT department, I realize you're an external provider, but I'd like you to say that you're that you work for the IT department, even though you're, you're even though you're a contractor. I'm delighted to say that we've got some business representatives in the house. Just about 70% of people have voted and that seems to be stable. Oh, just a couple of others coming in now. Let's see. Oh, that's fascinating. No external IT service providers as you will see when I share this poll with you. 16% representatives of the business department, very, very nice to have you on board. 58% the majority in the IT department and a number of consultants and trainers. Thank you very much for sharing that with me. Now, this is a topic I couldn't avoid mentioning because everybody seems to be talking about business and IT alignment. And once again, just as with other, other terms, business IT alignment is, um, is used and abused. So I'd like to share my thoughts as Humpty Dumpty on what I think it means. No, I, I think business, you know, when you talk about how well is IT aligned with the business? I'd say the degree to which IT as a business asset provides value to the business. And I'm thinking about IT and information as a business asset as opposed to other business assets that you could invest in. For instance, people, buildings, machines, capital. You know, they're all assets, production assets, production resources that you can use to produce whatever your organization produces. And the main questions are, these, these two ma major bullets, is your organization spending the right amount of time and money on information and IT as opposed to other business assets? If you're spending the right amount of money, then that's, that's the first step to having your IT aligned with the business. The second question is, if you're spending that amount of money, are you spending it well? And that boils down to the two, the two sub-bullets, which is really about decision-making and about execution. Decision-making, a very important part here is who is actually taking the decision, who's making the decision, We're talking about accountability, hopefully in the business that important decisions are taken by people in the business with the right degree of accountability. That's, I refer to the power paradigm, that little note, that number one there. Power type paradigm is about um, if the decision maker isn't, doesn't have enough power, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. So in, ensure that, the, that somebody with enough, enough power is actually taking the decision. It's the first part of decision making and that they're well informed. And then, obviously, you've got a role for the IT department to inform the business about the consequences of the various options um, that, that, that are available. So that's the, that's the decision-making part of uh, spending time and money well. Then you've got the ex execution part. Obviously, you've got to have the right kind of competences, technical, functional competences, but I would like to emphasize the, the fact that you've also got to have the right kind of relationships 
particularly between business and IT, does IT have enough what I call business empathy to engage at a meaningful level with the business? Or are they, you know, unfortunately you come, come across it from time to time, people who are sort of living in their own world and um, their own technical world, doing excellent technical stuff, but aren't able to communicate it in an effective way to the business. So that's about building relationships. Very keen on that. Statement number seven, business IT alignment. Still one of the most crucial but challenging areas, I put, align, put alignment in parenthesis, in, um, as, as I emphasized it, because some people talk about alignment, some people talk about uh, integration, some people talk about convergence, and that's a very interesting topic because I'm seeing the traditional IT department, which I said is under fire, both from the external service providers and from the business, I'm seeing a sort of a met metamorphosis of the IT department with part of it moving up into the business, converging with the business, and that traditional demand supply division that we have, that's sort of evaporating. Watch this space, it's a very interesting area. Now I'm sure some of you have seen this before. We offer three kinds of service, good, cheap and fast. You can pick any two. Good service cheap won't be fast. Good service fast won't be cheap and fast service cheap won't be good. In other words, there's always a trade-off. This is uh, this is a build-up to my final poll asking you, thinking about your organization and particularly um, including the business aspect, the fourth and fifth question here, questions here, if you had to choose between these, these five areas, what would you say is your organization's highest priority? Lowering cost of IT, improving the reliability of IT, increasing the speed of change of IT, using IT to improve business efficiency, which also means reducing business costs, or using IT to get more business or better business. And with just more than half of the, the votes in, there are some very interesting results coming in. Almost two-thirds. Oh, this is fascinating. I was talking to Professor Jerry Luftman last week. Jerry Luftman's done lots of research on this. I'm going to share, share something with you in a minute, which I think will delight him. I might be seeing him in a couple of weeks' time in the States, so I can uh, be delighted to, to share your ideas on this. These are your votes. Many of you saying we want to lower the cost of IT. Obviously, co cost is always, uh, always an issue. But an equal amount of you saying we want to use IT in our business organization to get more business. Now, why is this interesting? Because Jerry Luffman said uh, in his recent research, uh, but by the way, you'll find this research pretty easily, I think, if you look up Jerry Luftman, L-U-F-T-M-A-N, and C um, top IT management concerns. And if you can't find it, just send me an email or, or, or a tweet, and I'll, uh, I'll give you the link. He's seen this fifth part, using IT to improve business revenue, that's come into his top ten um, just this year, well, this, this past year. It's a, it's a survey about 2012. And he, he says this is very significant. He, he's called it, I think he called it a tipping point. People are really not just using IT to, to improve efficiency, but using it to, to get more business. Right, well, there are all the polls done, and now we've got about 15 minutes to go. 
just for the timing, where I'm going to touch on the second uh, standard or framework, the ISO as a standard. The ASL fr is, a, is a framework, the Application Services Library, which our not-for-profit foundation uh, shares with the world. Look on our website and you find lots of stuff on that. It describes the whole area, broad area, of application lifecycle management. You'll see in this diagram here, bottom left, operational application support, bottom right, changing the applications, maintenance and renewal, renewal if it's sort of major change, application strategy, top right, which equates with the smaller version, the smaller definition of ALM, and we're going to zoom into that in a minute, and top right, thinking about how do I organize application management in my, in my department. Anyway, this framework's broken down into into 20 odd uh, processes, which I'm certainly not going going to, going to go into detail here, but you can see, for instance, bottom right, the traditional life cycle kind of processes, whereas on the left, some of you who may be familiar with ITIL will see similar kind of stuff, continuity management, configuration management, and if you were to click on IT operation management, you'd find stuff like availability management and capacity management. And then there's the middle layer uh, in which you've got more managerial activities, managerial processes, like um, uh, engaging with a business with contract management with a service level agreement, or using subcontractors with the process supplier management on the right hand side in the middle. Now I'm going to zoom into the, the area top right, the application strategy area, and you'll see in the middle there's application lifecycle management and application portfolio management. I sort of like to cluster these, um, these together. This is really the area that most people are talking about when they're talking about application lifecycle management, these two processes. And you can see the three, three processes, the three um, ovals outside the box, which are the inputs for lifecycle management. On the left-hand side, you've got technological input. You now, um, Oracle comes up with a new, um, with a new kind of a database or a new kind of application, um, smartphone technology, stuff like that. Uh, mobile social, uh, social location-based, or technological stuff. But on the other side, in the organization at the top, customer organization strategy, if, um, if a company has just had uh, a merger or acquisition, for instance, or a reorganization, that's probably going to have some effect on the applications. Because certainly with mergers and acquisitions, suddenly you've got two CRM systems, if you, if you didn't have more to start with, and you've got to think about, you know, do we want to keep both of these systems? Do we want to con converge them, combine them, or replace them by a third one? And on the right-hand side, there are often developments in the environment of the customer. For instance, in um, a legislation, or if you're in a, take the, uh, the healthcare chain with general practitioners and... Um, uh, pharmacies, chemists, hospitals, there's a whole chain of organizations that work with each other and if in one part of the chain something happens with the information system then it usually has some effect on the uh, on the other part of the on the on the other organizations in the chain so that can also be input which makes you think about the life cycle of your applications so zooming into that just picking out one of the topics which you deal with in this area the first thing you've really got to do is you've got to assess the quality of your applications. And often people use this by assessing the functional quality and the technical quality. The functional quality, which some people call business quality, is how important is this application for your business? And really you can break that down into two questions. Look at the business process 
how important is that business process for your business? Is it really one of the primary processes that serves the customers? Or is it a secondary process which, although valuable, isn't as valuable as the primary process? So give that a score from 1 to 5, for instance. How important is it? And then ask yourself the question, or ask the business the question, how important is this application that we're talking about for that business process? And score that again on the score scale from 1 to 5. Multiply those two together. So maybe you've got a 2, two times 3, you've got a 6. So then you've got a functional quality of 6. You stick that on one of the axes. Then you look at the technical quality, and you do the same kind of thing for two aspects. One for the maintainability of systems, based on how much knowledge do you have. You know, for instance, if you've got an old system and you're finding it difficult to find to, to get people who have knowledge of the technology in the marketplace, because you know they they they. Either they're dying off of it or they're leaving the industry, then then you've got a that's a risk risk to your maintainability. First question, second question, how much knowledge of that application do you have within your organization? Usually that's within your your own organization. And how easy is it to maintain the application? Is it a bowl of spaghetti or is it is it pretty well structured? And the same kind of thing for the for the operational side. So then you combine those two things, maintainability and operationability, and you get, a, you get a, a score on the technical quality. And some of you will probably have recognized some, um, some of the quality characteristics that you'll find in the ISO 9126 model, which Quint uh, has enhanced in this diagram just going to leave it with you to make you aware of the fact that there's an ISO 9126 model that says something about application quality. And then you can get these two um, technical quality and functional quality aspects, map them on um, on a diagram like this. And then you'll see, and I've, I've got applications A, uh, A, B, C, D, Z, D, top, top, uh, t until H here the number of applications, and you can see, for instance, that the application B here, that's a fairly high functional quality, and the technical quality is fairly reasonable. So you could say that's in a safe area where it's justified to continue in renewing, uh, without any major investments, renewing the functionality of, the, of this application as opposed to application G, which apparently has little value to the business, low value to the business, and it's also of poor technical quality. So really, you should think about retiring that. A is, a, is an, an absolutely different, a different question. A is extremely valuable to the business, but it's, um, it's in a dangerous position. It's difficult to maintain or it's um, difficult to keep operational. So you, could, you should consider replacing that application, either by re rebuilding it, redeveloping it, uh, if it's a bespoke application, or replacing it by a standard package. So this sort of helps you with the, with the broad brush strategies that you can apply to, to applications. We have about five minutes to go, so I'm going to go through um, through the rest of the presentation fairly quickly. You'll have this stuff uh, available after the event, and if you um, if you want any more detail on any of the material, please get in touch with me. I'd be more than pleased to help. This is stuff that our friends at Capgem I used to work at Capgemini. My friends at Capgemini came up with eight different strategies to extend the life of an application varying from uh, demolishing it, bottom right, to uh, replatforming it, replacing it, uh, enhancing it. And you can see uh, you can see that for yourselves. So that brings us up to statement eight of twelve. Application decommissioning 
and other forms of rationalization, for instance, consolidization, they are significantly more challenging than the initial development. And this is why people often struggle with, with getting rid of applications. We often have, have too many applications in our, in our organization and therefore too high costs. If you can get your hands on this, get a grip on decommissioning, then you'll make yourself particularly popular. One of the techniques to get a grip on, on your application is to realize that, that the landscape is very hybrid and with a transport metaphor, you could say some of your applications are trains, mass transport for A to B, which your company depends on, whereas other applications are either buses or cars or scooters, like the app on your smartphone is like a scooter. Obviously, you treat that app differently than the train application. So that brings us to statement number nine. Because your application landscape is hybrid, it needs a different kind of approach. So you'll have to develop different kind of approaches depending on the different kind of applications. Statement number 10, two to go. Determining application strategy is more about people than process. I just shared with you that um, little technique of using functional quality and technical quality to assess the current state of applications. You know, that's sort of explaining a process, how you get to that. It's really not about the process. It's about having the right people, and particularly the business people, at the table and having that discussion about the application, which obviously results in the application status, but it's about engaging the business people in these discussions. That's really the main thing. Now, as I suspected, uh, I was too ambitious with this program, so, so the topics agile and cloud computing, I'm just going to give you the management summary, the executive summary with, and leave you to look at the detailed sheets at your leisure after the event. Uh, I believe the uh, you'll I believe you'll get an email when the when this presentation when this webinar is available uh, on demand. The main statement is agile, which is often used in in the initial application development, can also be applied to maintenance successfully, but you need to address some specific maintenance concerns, and I've summed them up on the previous sheet. And then summing up the um, the software as a service and cloud computing um, part, the final statement I'd like to share with you, management of software as a service from a customer point of view, so if you're in an IT department and you're using software as a service as provided by an external service provider, that requires a significant investment in particular kind of competencies if you're going to do this successfully. And again, I refer you to the sheets. I'll also refer you to um, a, a paper I wrote on what I call cloudy application management, which dives into this in a little bit more detail. Finally, as Alec said at the beginning, we have a full-blown seminar in London on the 28th of February. These are uh, the sessions we're going to have, I have the pleasure, pleasure of chairing it, doing a couple of the sessions. Take a look at the website, and if you're, if you're based in London or if it's easily accessible, we'd love to have you there. So with that, I'm going to see whether you have posed any questions, which you have, but I can't. Will the slides be out? I can see the questions now. Will the slides be available after the webinar? Yes, they will. Uh, could we see that previous ISO slide again? Sorry, we've run out of time. Uh, if you want, if you want to see it urgently, please send me an email because my details are here. Mark dot Smalley at aslbislfoundation dot org or you could use mark.smalley 
but sorry, mark at smallly.it, IT, or use Twitter, and I'll be pleased to, sh to send you that slide. So with that, I'd like to thank you on behalf of Unicorn, Unicorn for joining the, uh, the seminar, and I hope to see you again sometime, and maybe even in, um, in London next month. Bye now.